Uh, good morning. Uh, so we will continue with uh, Maria Fapoli's uh, presentation of her book, The Nature of Truth. Today, uh, this morning, we will, uh, she will speak about semantic paradoxes, and we will have Professor Tudo Baitu uh, making some comments to, to her presentation and to her book. So uh, thank you very much, Maria. Okay, good morning to everybody, and thank you. And I'm surprised that you are still here. <laughs> thank you very much. I feel very honored. So, um, well, uh, uh, I remember Vasilis said yesterday that if a theory of truth could uh, uh, solve the liar paradox away, this would be a good feature for, a, for this kind of theory. And I think that the liar paradox is quite uh, easy to uh, to dissolve, in fact, to dissolve if we look at it from the point of view of uh, our presentation theory. And I hope, I mean, uh, I have already present, uh, I have already presented here every everything you need in order to understand what, what is going on in the in the liar paradox. So I'm not going to say anything essentially different, essentially new today. So I'm just going to present so to apply what we have said to the paradox. And I hope to show that the paradox, the paradox doesn't deserve the attention it has had in the last century. So I think my diagnosis would be that the people who people who insist in considering the liar paradox as a real problem for a theory of truth, those people don't know contemporary philosophy of language. So the contemporary, so the philosophy of language uh, we do today, uh, uh, now, so at present, is perfectly able to solve this kind of paradox. So the idea uh, uh, is there a liar paradox. Okay, possibly the simplest. I, I mean, I, I, there are many different uh, formulations of the liar paradox, mm -hmm. but possibly the simplest. One are the following two. I'm lying, and this sentence is false. Uh, any formulation of the liar paradox is a falsity ascription in my sense of the word. A falsity ascription. I have here presented. Uh, I have here presented a truth ascriptions, but we can also ascribe falsity to a content. It's, it's a, exactly the same kind of movement. So uh, both uh, versions of the liar paradox are falsity ascriptions. That is, they are pro sentences whose potential content has to be inherited from felicitous acts of assertion. To say it directly, asking whether one and two are true or false is a category mistake in Ryle's sense. Uh, liar sentences, this kind of sentence, since they are ascriptions, can be used to say something true or false only derivatively. So one and two are context-dependent expressions which don't say anything in absence of a, a genuine assertive speech act from which they borrow a semantically evaluable content. Uh, and the situation doesn't change if a further ascription is added. For instance, in the following exchange, speaker A uh, say what B says is true, and speaker B says uh, what A says is false. Okay. If you multiply ascriptions without offering 
a contentful speech act from which they can inherit their content, if you multiply ascriptions without that, the whole series of ascriptions would, would still be empty. Okay? The idea is, uh, well, you know, uh, so what uh, B says is true, doesn't say anything. If you have in, a con in context A uh, that Victoria says, my brother is at school, or in context uh, B, my, uh, my new flat is really comfortable, or Porto Alegre is south from Fortaleza, and you say what Victoria says is true, again, out of a context, what Victoria says is true, doesn't say anything. It's just a variable. If you relate this ascription to the first context, the content of the ascription will be that Victoria's brother is at school. The content of, of the ascription, when you relate it to the second to context B, will be Victoria's new flat is really comfortable, and so on. But out of a context, an ascription, a truth, or oh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, a truth or falsity ascription that is irrelevant. An ascription is a linguistic entity that possesses linguistic meaning but lacks content altogether. Okay. What you are saying is that uh, is true. What you told us that is true is identical with the interlocutionary report, Victoria, so you probably say it. It's, it's just an explicitation of, of uh, the interlocutionary report, which I use now. No. So wait uh, uh, a little bit, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to explain what I mean. Uh, here in this example, the idea is, well, I have said uh, the same, I mean, I have insisted in this idea in the, in the last two days, but the idea is a, a truth ascription as a speech act is a second order speech act in the sense that to be contentful, uh, contentful it needs a previous uh, assert, assertive act from which it can inherit its content. This is the idea, but it is not just that we have to act. Because here, we might have two different acts. It is that we need to act at least, but one of them has to be a genuine assertive act in which a proposition is put forward. Otherwise, the whole series of ascriptions would keep to be empty. So, uh, so the idea is a chain of ascriptions doesn't express a content unless there is a level at which a genuine assertion has been produced. A genuine assertion. So in order for, a, for the description in three to be grounded, speakers A and B have to refer to something already said in a technical sense of said, not just uttered. Uttering words doesn't necessarily imply to say something in the relevant sense of saying, okay? So, an analogous situation would be if we had a chain, uh, in, in, imagine a chain of anaphorically linked pronouns without at the end of the chain having an anaphoric head from which it could inherit the content. So the content would be, so the, 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 the combination of all, of all these uh, anaphoric uses would have the effect of 
putting all the information together, which is one of the functions of anaphoric uh, links. But they wouldn't have a content because the content is provided by the anaphoric head. So the term who in the first place offer, offers the content to which, or put forward the, the content to which all of them indirectly refer. Okay, this, this is the, 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 uh, the analogy. So, uh, when people, uh, so, uh, 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 when people uh, face an explanation like, like, like the one I'm giving here, I'm offering here, sometimes people say, okay, but look at this kind of example, the second one that I have uh, introduced at the beginning of my talk. Look at this kind of example. Imagine that we have a, a sentence like this, like, like this one. This sentence is false then you don't need a further speech act because the, uh, the subject of the sentence refers to the sentence itself. So apparently this sentence provides with everything you need to understand what is going on, what is, uh, what is going on in, a, in a speech act in, w in which it uh, has been used. But this is a marriage. This is false. And no difference is made if we, when we say, when we include, so change uh, the expression, this sentence to the expression, this proposition is false. Because the word proposition by itself doesn't have a magical effect. Just by saying proposition, you don't produce a proposition. You need an act in which a proposition is produced, but not the, the, the mere word. So, sometimes when people, uh, well, this is a, the classical way of solving the paradox that has produced many different theories, for instance, the, uh, Russell, uh, the Russellian type theory and many others, sometimes people blame reflexivity for the paradoxes and say, okay, the problem is that the liar sentences are reflexive. My diagnosis is that reflexivity doesn't play any role in the production of the paradox. So these sentences are faulty in some sense, but not because they are reflexive. There are many reflexive ass assertions that are perfectly okay, that are perfectly acceptable, for instance. So consider the difference between sentence two, which is the liar, one of the liar sentences, so this sentence is false, and sentence five. This is an English sentence. This is an English sentence, the sentence is self-reflexive, is reflexive. Is there anything wrong with this sentence? The answer is not at all. What is then the problem or what is the difference between uh, a, a liar sentence and a sentence like this one? Well, the contrast between examples two and five poses the issue of the bearers of properties, the bearers of properties. Not every property applies to the same set of objects or concepts. For instance, being red is a property of things, of physical objects, things that have a surface against which light can be reflected, for instance. Okay, being an English sentence is a property of string of words. Being uh, the sum of two primes is a property of numbers. Being a liar is a property of rational agents. Being false is a property of what somebody says in a felicitous assertive speech act. So it's a property of propositions. Then, if I if I not, I mean if if I don't respect 
this simple classification, what we have are category mistakes. My book is read. The sentence can be used to say something true or false. But my attitude is read. It's just nonsense. Unless we are uh, giving to, to this sentence a metaphorical explanation, and we can talk about metaphor uh, at the end, if you, if you like. This sentence is true. It's an English sentence. This sentence is true. It's an English sentence. It's a sentence by means of which we can say something true or false. But my daughter is an English sentence. It's just nonsense. Seven is a prime number. Can be used to say something true or false, but but my twelve, my thirteen years old uh, son is a prime number. It's just nonsense. Craig said something like that. Hmm? The president is a liar. Is usually true. Uh, versus the coffee pot is a liar. It's just nonsense. And what she said is true. Uh, can be true or false, but what she what she bought is true. It's just nonsense. So this all these things are quite uh, trivial, quite obvious. But I want to uh, to focus on the problem. So sentences are not bearers of truth. The bearers of truth are propositions. So the liar paradox. Uh, uh, a speech act in which a liar sentence is put forward is a faulty speech act in which a part is missing, the missing from which the, the sentence can inherit its content. So sentences as, as uh, sorry, sentences as uh, such uh, are not truth bearers. Uh, they are only capable of bearing truth indirectly. We say that a sentence is true if an agent says something by using it, something true, but at least say something by using it. So, the analogy. You remember yesterday that I, uh, I explained uh, the, the semantic core of, the, of presentationalism, uh, tracing the, the analogy between pro-sentences and pronouns. The analogy is exact, it's correct. So the idea is, imagine, consider sentence, she is blown. Is sentence uh, six true or false? Na neither. So we don't know. The sentence six, uh, six doesn't say anything unless we use it in an appropriate context. So. The basic idea of uh, the theory of truth I'm trying to defend is that sentences are not truth bearers. This claim, uh, this claim applies to any kind of sentence, although it is easier to understand it related to non-eternal sentences like uh, six. Let's see. Okay. And if I say that uh, uh, sentences are not truth better, this is easier to explain, so it's easier to understand if the sentence we, we use as an example is a non-eternal sentence, like this one, chief long. Everybody understands that a sentence as, as such, uh, that, that this sentence as such doesn't possess truth condition, doesn't say anything. But the same happens. Exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are different things, but when you okay, so uh, I have said don't possess truth conditions, and I want to say it just so uh, I, I will explain it in a while. But you are right; it's not the same thing. It's not the same, but it is not. The, 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 the idea is, so it is not that they 
say something which is neither true nor false. The idea is that they don't say anything. So they are no, they are not, uh, so they are no entity able to bear truth values. Okay, so I think that, that one, sorry? No, 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 not just string, uh, string words. This is an English sentence. It's a correct linguistic entity. It's a well, uh, it's a well formed uh, sentence. So it's nothing that I mean. It's not. It's not nothing. <laughs> it's something. It's a, it's, a, it's a part of our linguistic system. It's an instrument that we can use to do things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, for instance. Okay. Well, Okay. But, but, but if you use it in a proper context, where uh, there is a record, where there is a discourse record, uh, and, and that the discourse record is female, and uh, you succeed in referring to that record with C, that, and that record is closed, then that sentence will be true. Si. Indirectly. Exactly. So it has to be Yeah, but general. Okay, so general in the, in the following, well, let me, uh, so allow me uh, five minutes because it's something that I, I mean, I, that I have developed. No, no, it's perfect. But uh, it, it's a very good question. But it's something, I mean, uh, and you can explain the difference between uh, truth conditions and truth, uh, and truth value in, in different uh, ways. But uh, it's something that I, I have, I have thought about. So, okay. The sentence or the proposition? Uh, the sentence, because the sentence, but, but, but yeah, but. No, no. But. The difference you are pointing out is. And proposition, yes. But I have to say that I'm not, I mean, because I am a pragmatist, I'm really an instrumentalist. What I mean is that I, I'm, I mean, I'm not fighting about words. So if you prefer to say things in your way, it's perfect. So uh, you know what I mean. So I have a way of saying things, but I don't object to as far uh, to to, as, to some of, to some alternative way of, of saying things. So as far as we understand what we are talking about, <laughs> we can say uh, things in the way we prefer. Okay. So I don't. I, I mean, I I, I don't have a. a precise and strict definition of what truth conditions are. So we can use the term in, 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 fl in a flexible way. But in this case, the distinction must be very clear because uh, if you say what you said, I can only understand if I understand the sentence not as proposition. So with no, the no. sentence, I'm not saying anything because I'm not, uh, if I'm not Considering the proposition exactly. connected with the sentence. So yeah. this, this must be very clear. Yeah, it is clear. Okay. And it is clear for him too. Okay. So the, the idea is that he is pointing at uh, something else, I think, and I I will explain the distinction in a while. Okay, so I was saying that, um, that the thesis that sentences are not truth bearers it's easier to understand when we think of non-eternal sentences. But unfortunately, sometimes when we uh, talk about truth, the kind of sentence we use are the kind uh, called eternal sentences. Eternal sentences have, let's say, a stable truth value. And this uh, truth value uh, doesn't change from a context to another one. So it produces the effect that it is the sentence itself, the entity uh, which bears the truth value. But still, I think that this is wrong. So uh, uh, saying that Brasilia is the capital of the Federal Republic of Brazil is a true sentence is just a piece of loose talking. 
Sometimes it is harmless. But as the liar paradox shows, it is not always harmless. So the content of the mentioned sentence is recoverable without substantive contextual information. Its favorite content is a development of the sentence's linguistic meaning. This is, I mean, now I, I think I, I am in a position to answer your question. The idea is some sentences, for instance, Brasilia is the capital of the Federal Republic of Brazil, some sentences have uh, attached, let's say, a favored content in the sense that everybody can imagine what would be the content that <coughs> would be produced by using the sentence in a context. So the content is, as I have said, recoverable from the very sentence. But it doesn't mean that it is the sentence, the bearer of truth values. Still, the bearer of truth values is the proposition put forward. What happened with truth ascriptions? Truth as so, uh, if I had, not just with, with a truth ascription, but if I had a a sentence like this one, his brother denied what she claimed, just this sentence, his brother denied what she claimed, uh, I wouldn't say that the content of the content of this sentence, the content that somebody can put forward or produce by means of this sentence is recoverable from the very sentence. I wouldn't say so. So the question is, does this sentence, does this sentence possess truth conditions? Uh, yes, let's, yeah, in a trivial, in a trivial way, because as I see it, uh, the truth condition of a sentence like Brasilia is the capital of the Federal Republic of Brazil are quite clear. There is a city and there is a country and they stand in some relation. Okay, easy. But now, which are the truth conditions of a sentence like his brother denied what she claimed? Oh yeah, there is a brother, there is a sister, and then one says something and the other rejected it. Uh, I don't know, but I think that we can see that it's not the same level. So we are, we are, going more and more abstract and the highest level of abstraction are truth conditions. If I say, well, it doesn't matter. If I say what she says is true as a sentence, would you say that a sentence like this one has truth conditions? Yeah, or no, or I don't know. So what she says is true. Which are the truth conditions of a sentence like this one? Well, I mean, it. I can imagine. Yeah, somebody says something. Uh, uh, the, the, the agent of the speech act uh, to, which it is, uh, to which the sentence refers is a woman, and she says something, and I endorse it, or whatever, or it corresponds to reality or use your favorite definition. But there is a sense in which it is not the same. So in terms of truth conditions, it's not the same. Saying that uh, Brasilia is the capital of Brazil and saying that what she says is true. The way in which I explain it sometimes is saying that in the former cases, in, the case, in this case, in, in case of uh, a part of this sentence seven, the content of the speech act is a development of the linguistic meaning of the, of the sentence used in it. We produce 
a content by taking advantage of the linguistic meaning of the word I use. But there are some other cases, like truth ascriptions, in which the content of the speech act is not a development of the linguistic meaning of the, of the sentence used. Uh, here, consider uh, again these examples. If I say what Victoria says is true, relating my speech act to context one, what I'm saying is that Victoria's brother is at school. Now, what is the relationship in terms of linguistic meaning between my brother is at school and what Victoria says is true? I would say no, not all. They don't even share a single word. Okay? So we can say things using sentences that don't have any relation in terms of linguistic meaning with the content that are produced by the utterance of the, of the sentence. Okay? So in this sense, I think that so oh, all this argument is uh, aimed at uh, 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 illustrating the idea that pro-sentences are viables. Pro-sentences are viables. So they are sentences, of course, but they are a peculiar, way, a peculiar kind of sentence. We can express any content whatsoever using a pro-sentence, and this content wouldn't be, in any case, a development of the linguistic meaning of the terms used in the pro-sentence. Wouldn't. So what Victoria says cannot be developed in any proposition. It's a variable. My brother is at school. My brother is at school. As a sentence, can be developed in order to recover the proposition that we can produce by using the sentence. But what Victoria says is true. What is the content that we put forward by the use of this sentence in isolation? The answer is no. Could like maybe em emphasize that this point by pointing out that like is actually a definite description. Yes. It's at least approximately synonymous with the X such that Victoria says an X. And so if you look at it that way, it's clearly a mm -hmm. critical way. Yes, thank you very much. And this is the way in which Ramsey explains this situation and also Christopher Williams. This is why I have said that, uh, so the, the, uh, I have said that uh, pro sentences are vehicles of generalization. Every time we use a pro-sentence, we have a generalization. A, a generalization doesn't mean, uh, doesn't mean a universal generalization. Sometimes we have, as when we say everything the Pope says, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we have here a universal generalization. But every time that we use a pro-sentence, what we have is a, a higher, a, 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 an act, which is not first order, let's say, whose content is, uh, uh, so, an act uh, whose uh, structure has to be explained by means of, of variables and quantifiers of some kind, for instance, the crypto or uh, universal quantifiers or whatever, okay? So I think that this is important. I mean, the, the difference is important. Uh, for instance, in one of uh, his latest books, books uh, in perspectival meaning, I think, Recanati uh, 
uh, suggested that we uh, that we should get rid of uh, the notion of linguistic meaning. I think that those sentences show that we shouldn't. So there is no problem in get in getting rid of uh, the, the, the level of linguistic meaning when we are trying to understand uh, trying to understand uh, first first order ordinary sentences. There's no problem. It's okay. But in order to understand prose sentences, as I have said in my first conference, in order to understand uh, proforms, we need a two factors theory of meaning. Essentially, we need a level uh, uh, which provides with the suitable stability in meaning. Otherwise, we would say that that those sentences are ambiguous. They are not ambiguous in the, in the list. They have a linguistic meaning which is stable. We don't change their linguistic meaning, but their content is completely, essentially context dependent. Okay? So, uh, And now, uh, so just uh, to conclude somehow, truth and falsity ascriptions as sentences, when we consider uh, them as uh, pieces of language, cannot be neither true nor false for two reasons. First, because no sentence can. And second, because there is nothing like a favor content for them. The contents are not a development of, of the linguistic meaning. Now, and just to conclude, uh, so what I'm going to, to do now is the following. Uh, uh, what happened with the Laia Fordos is, is something quite curious because if you look at the, so if you look at the, at the uh, uh, words of, of the philosophers of, of contemporary philosophers of language, they reject all the assumptions that you need to derive the paradox. But the proponents that, that people ha that, that uh, have made a life uh, just uh, interpreting the paradox doesn't look at this uh, uh, kind of literature. So sometimes I say that. To solve, to dissolve the liar paradox, we only need to do an exercise of data crossing. Just look at the liar paradox and look at what uh, philosophers of language say about how language works. So contrasting, uh, okay, so nothing, 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 nothing. Okay, yeah. I have said no sentence is. Uh, either true or false. And here is a, a text, a quotation by the Grishlis, as a by Frege in the Grishlis. Uh, uh, Frege says, we can imagine a language in which the proposition Archimedes perished at the capture of Syracuse would be expressed thus. The violent death of Archimedes at the capture, uh, at the capture of Syracuse is a fact. To be sure, one can distinguish between subject and predicate here too, if one wishes to do so, but the subject contains the whole content and the predicate serves only to turn the content into a judgment. Such a language would have only a single predicate for all judgments, namely, is a fact. So, in the Greek list, there is just one predicate. The only predicate in the whole work is, is a fact. We see that there cannot be a, a, any suggestion here of subject and predicate in the ordinary sense. Our, our ideography is a language of this sort, and in it, design, design, design uh, yeah, is the common predicate for all judgments. <laughs> okay? And here, 
for the idea that uh, for the idea that so, uh, uh, that no sentence can be a truth bearing. So Sperberg and Wilson, for instance, said, said, verbal communication is a complex form of communication. Linguistic coding and decoding is involved, but the linguistic meaning of an utterance, uh, so, sorry, of an, ad, of an utter sentence, falls short of encoding what the speaker means. It merely helps the audience infer what she means. The output of the coding is correctly treated by the audience as a piece of evidence about the communicator's intention. In other words, a coding-decoding process is subservient uh, to a Gracian inferential process. This means that Perry and Wilson, for instance, consider that sentences are means by which a speaker allows his audience to infer the intentions, his intentions. But the process of coding and decoding, the process that, mm, let's say, map words with their linguistic meaning, falls, uh, falls short of producing a complete content, a complete uh, semantically evaluable content. Okay. And again, the same the same idea. Recanati says, for instance, in general, even if we know who is speaking, when, to whom, and so forth, the conventional meaning of the word falls short of supplying enough information to exploit this knowledge of the context so as to secure understanding of what is said. The meaning of the sentence in this case, as in many others, as in many others, seriously under underdetermined what is said, nor is it this and the determination limited to the reference of referring expressions. So, Recanati doesn't, uh, doesn't reduce this underdetermination to provide the references of the referential expressions, but uh, of understanding the meaning of the words, any kind of words used. So, what I mean is that if you look at different philosophers, so from Frege till Recanati, going through, I don't know, Austin, or Grice, or Strawson, or Sperber and Wilson, and so on, everybody says that sentences are not the vehicle. So sentences as such don't provide with a content capable of being true or false. But this is what is required uh, to the, uh, for the uh, lie of paradox to be produced. And just nothing enough. Okay. I'm not going to explain Tarski's uh, diagnosis and so on because it's too much. Just Okay, Barwis oh, and Chemendi, which are defenders of the of situation semantics, which is a completely representationalist theory of meaning, even then, even they uh, say truth, as we ordinarily understand the notion, is a property of things like claims testimony, assertions, beliefs, statements, or propositions. It is not a property of sentences, but the decision to use, uh, to use sentences as the verdict of truth has proven to be a useful fiction, a good way of getting a certain amount of logic done without begging down, and, uh, sorry, uh, without uh, uh, bogging down in the astrological question about the nature of the verdict of truth. But the fiction is harmless only in cases where we can unambiguously associate a claim about the world with each sentence, or where the, the slippage between different claims made by different uses of a sentence is negligible uh, for the purposes at hand. What I mean is that the useful fiction is not harmless in the least, like the history of the liar paradox proves. But even them, who are representationalist 
in the strictest sense, accept that sentences are not the bearers of truth. Uh, okay, so... Uh, to conclude, even the state of language, of language sciences at the time in which uh, Tarski wrote his work on truth, Tarski cannot be blamed of having made truth a property of sentences. I mean, I'm not blaming Tarski. Uh, he uh, he uh, wrote his work in the in the 30s of the last century. It's okay. Nevertheless, linguistic and the philosophy of language have evolved a great deal from Tarski's time, and now it is no longer justi justifiable to maintain his assumption. The assumption that truth only makes sense when characterizes propositional content, i.e. what is said by the use of sentences in successful acts of assertion, not only place the analysis of truth in complete accordance with the current state of science, but it also offers, uh, but, uh, but it also offers us the opportunity to get rid of one of the most far-reaching parts of the history of philosophy. So, thanks for your attention. I actually, I know you're not a realist, but I think that your point is very realist. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I think one could say that sentences generated by the language faculty are not very true, but sentences in the language of thought are very true, and not every sentence generated by the language faculty has a correspondent interpretation exactly. in the language of thought. So a sentence like this sentence is false. The language faculty generates that, but the language of thought cannot interpret it. There's no corresponding sentence in the language of thought. Yeah, it's a way of saying it. Yeah, yeah. I don't object it. No. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I can call with you. We <laughs> <laughs> can have five minutes of discussion, but then I will start the work uh, to do the <laughs> okay. I'm stuck in the distinction, trying to understand all of that in the distinction between sentence and proposition. So would say that the language of thought is propositional. Uh, it, it, it could play that role. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. In some sense, because for instance, uh, people like, I mean, Fodor or, I don't know, or Recanati would say that, for instance, you cannot, uh, the, the language is in the language of thought. I mean, this is a metaphor, of course. Uh, cannot be ambiguous, for instance, because they don't they don't have um, uh, gaps, and in this sense, a sentence is in the language of food. Even though I don't like this metaphor, in fact, yeah, you are right. Uh, play the role that I have um, attributed here to propositions. Some play this this role, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I see that one could object to. Well, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's a good objection, but uh, I imagine that someone would go like, uh, so we, we, we have some kind of dilemma here. So either there is a category mistake in attributing the values to someone, or there is not. And so let's grant that there is a category mistake in saying that the sentence P is there uh, well, it seems that there is more than one way I can explain why it's a category mistake. So, for example, if I if I have a theory that says that truth bearers are ordered pairs of sentences with Tarskian uh, interpretations for sequences or whatever, yeah. Right. So, regimented sentences with their interpretations. These are the truth bearers. So, uh, these sentences. He is there doesn't have an interpretation, so it can't be said to be true or false because uh, it's incomplete, right? And then it would consist in a category mistake to say that uh, this pure sentence or uninterpreted sentence uh, is, is is true or false. Uh, but even then, um, if we give this explanation of some 
why I thought that we were a mistake through a description. Um, one could argue that it doesn't follow that in the case of the, the liar sentence, at the sentence that follows, uh, we don't have an interpretation in this case. Uh, so it would appear that uh, I can have an interpretation for, for, for this sentence, right? I mean, uh, I can have a Cartesian model uh, in which uh, this sentence is an object in the, uh, in the domain of that model and it satisfies, it, it, it's in the extension of a certain predicate right there. And, you know, there is an interpretation. So, so it is not a category mistake because it is not non interpreted. So, uh, and another way to go would be to say, well, okay, let, let's grant it again that, that the true pairs are, are not sentences but propositions. Okay, so we have this uh, derived version of, of, of the, the, uh, the liar sentence or, or the self referring sentence. Uh, the proposition that I am expressing right now is false. Right? So here I'm again using a definite description just just as just as when I, I, I use the definite description uh, what Maria said to refer to the proposition expressed by, by Maria's assertion. I am now using the definite description of the proposition expressed by my present act of assertion to refer to the proposition expressed to my own act <laughs> of uh, uh, so, um, yes, this is the, the okay. Of course, you can argue, and many, so some uh, uh, authors have argued in similar ways. But the idea is well, the, the, I have several uh, levels of answering your your objections. One of them, when you say about Turkey. Uh, for instance, you say, okay, in this case, uh, we will have an, an interpretation, so it's not an, a category mistake because we don't, ha we, we really have a, a, an interpretation. It's not, uh, let's say, it's not incomplete. The, the, the entity to which we attribute true is not, is not incomplete. To say it directly, this is irrelevant in the sense that there are two, two different, uh, two different, uh, how can I say it? Uh, Diagnosis here, first, or the first one is, sometimes you cannot apply truth to an incomplete incomplete entity. This is one thing. But the notion of category mistake also covers the following uh, situation, the situation in which even though you have a complete entity, it is not an entity of the appropriate kind. Like in the case in which I say, my son is a prime number. Okay? So one of the problems, I, I mean, I, if you remember how this, uh, uh, this uh, presentation, so the, the title of this presentation, I, I have uh, entitled it, Higher Order concept. I think that one of the problems uh, that, uh, that uh, explain why we haven't been able till recently to get rid of the liar paradox is because we don't, uh, we don't distinguish between first order and higher order, speech act, or concept, and so on. So I would answer your first question this way. And the second, uh, the second one I, I don't think that I understand, but you can say the proposition of, of the, the proposition that uh, uh, she is expressing now is uh, true or is false or whatever. I have said uh, I don't know if, if you are pointing that, at this fact, but I have said that using the word proposition doesn't have a magical effect. Even if you say the proposition expressed by her speech act, if there if there, uh, there is no as genuine and successful assertive speech act, we don't have a proposition. And my position about the, the liar paradox is not 
ad hoc. And I'm not inventing this piece of theory. I, I have tried to show you mm -hmm. that the idea that propositions as contents of successful assertive acts are the truth bearers is something that philosophers of language of any kind now accept. And all of them reject the idea that sentences are the bearers of these semantic properties. So, like yesterday, I want to insist that I'm trying to understand what is on in the liar paradox by taking profit first of the way in which we use words in our of our ordinary exchanges, but also of the theories put forward by contemporary philosophers of language and linguists. I don't know if this answers your question. Uh, maybe I, I haven't understood you. No, yeah. There is another configuration, maybe that is the huge importance to the simple form of property development. So, those very examples you you, you presented of uh, reflexive contact, which are related to those uh, acts of assertion, for example, this is a sentence in English. And when, when to me that when, when you say that the, the liar sentence uh, doesn't inherit uh, content from a previous um, linguistic act or, or uh, entity, um, uh, in this case, where, where I use uh, this sentence in the sentence in, in English, um, there is no previous sentence or assertion uh, to which I'm referring to, and, and yet there is no problem with this, right? So why there is, a, is there a problem with the liar sentence only and not with this other reflexive? Sentence? Well, this was my part of my point, that the predicate in the second sentence, in a sentence uh, such, uh, such as uh, this is an English sentence, you are predicating a property to an entity which is appropriate for this property. Because being an English sentence is a property of sentences. Nothing wrong here. But being true is not a property of sentences. It's a property of propositions. So in the second case, you, ha you are attributing a property to a suitable entity, which is a sentence, but not in the first case. This, this was my point. And this is why I, I, I insist in this uh, notion of the bearers of properties and this idea of the uh, category mistake. Mm -hmm. And I would like to think that uh, the if we change the liar sentence and make it a Truther, um, the guy who says the truth sentence, mm -hmm. then it would be objection and objection to your point. But I'm not thinking it's act, it actually supports your point. So look at this sentence. Um, so I'm taking Luis, Luis's case, right? I'm not talking about sentence. It's third point. So the proposition I, will, I am now expressing with this very word that I am saying is true. The proposition I am now expressing with this is true. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, to say, well, no problem with that, so you lose, right? But I'm thinking there's a problem with that, because in a sense, what I just said is nonsense. And that's the, same the thing. category mistake, it's the same category mistake, so you would like to support that, right? Yeah. So if I say the proposition I, I'm now expressing is true, again, I haven't said anything. Yeah, and um, I think of it, uh, I think I have told you that I'm, in fact, I'm an inferentialist. So I'm not representationalist at all. Imagine if I say the proposition I'm saying is true, in order for, for my uh, speech act to produce a proposition, I should be able to explain what follows from it and from, and from which it follows. It follows. What follows from a proposition, which is nothing, but a proposition like, 
the proposition I'm producing right now is true. Nothing at all, because there is no proposition produced. Okay? And in another sense, uh, so, something, uh, part of my problems with the liars, I, I mean, I can't understand how so uh, such uh, intelligent people like, I don't know, Hartree Field and many others, Anil Gupta, and, uh, have made of the liar sentence, of the liar paradox, their lives. What do, do we mean by lying? By lying, we mean saying something which is false saying something that we don't believe. Okay, mm -hmm. full stop. But as if, as if it were true. As if it were true. Well, okay, yeah, but the, the first part is saying something. What are you saying when you say this is false? You are not saying anything. So your act has no effect from an inferential point of view. And if you are a representationalist, your sentence doesn't represent any state of affairs, which is the state of affairs represented in a sentence like, I'm lying. Nothing, or oh, this is false. There are variables. So their content, their virtual content, are not a development of the linguistic meaning. So by themselves, they don't produce any kind of proposition. Okay. And this is, this is my. <laughs> One minute. So your point would be that eventually, translate this into uh, what you would do with that piece of information. Uh, exactly. And if it is true or false, the the sentence I'm saying is a lie. If it is true or false, change change nothing at all. You can't do anything about that because there is no information on that. There is no information. It's just a, a, a it, it seems to be a proposition, but it's not a proposition. It's not a proposition because it's made of a prof form, prof sentence, mm -hmm. and and a variable is empty unless you connect it with a, a proposition. Yes? Okay. Uh, do you have slides to do? Do you have slides? No. Okay, so okay. No, 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 it's going to be really easy. Um, okay, so it's uh, okay. Mm. So I'd like first to thank uh, Maria for this tour de force. <laughs> six six uh, lectures in uh, three days. It's, it's quite impressive. With jet lag. With jet lag. Uh, it's, a, it's a proof of stamina. I'm in a state of quasi-technical uh, knockout here. <laughs> okay. So... Um, <clears throat> I also like to point out that it's really rare to benefit directly from the author's feedback and clarifications. I also want to apologize for my uh, lack of uh, knowledge in philosophy of science. And I really would like to thank uh, John and Vasilis and Adriano and Luis for uh, making the relevant comments about the liar's paradox. Um, I understood that there is a huge, uh, basically, disagreement between you, uh, what you take to be the structure of language, and what Russell takes to be the structure of language, and the liar paradox arises uh, uh, when you assume this um, atomic view on, on, on propositions. Uh, so it's an attempt to idealize natural language as so it can fit, for example, you know, the, the purposes of uh, first order, second order, whatever, logic. Um, unfortunately, I cannot comment on that because I really don't know what to say. I understand the difference, but that's, that's about it. 
Now, one thing is that your approach strikes me as more in line with the naturalistic turn and the overall desire of contemporary philosophy to find some points of intersection with empirical science. So I think that's, that's, a, good, uh, that's a good move. You want to have an account of truth that actually applies to natural uh, language as opposed to some kind of idealized form of uh, model of natural language like, uh, like Russell did. Now, they said, I'll go to some, a more general comment, which I can, uh, I can comment on. So it struck me that the overall uh, approach adopted in the book parallels quite closer quite a lot of other debates in philosophy. And in particular, there's one in philosophy of biology, philosophy of biology being my cup of tea. So I think the key premise of the book is that uh, a distinction can be made uh, between the meaning of the concept of truth, on the one hand, and the epistemic criteria that allow us to establish truth, what's usually called, uh, denominated by truth conditions. So in other words, what the concept of truth is should not be confused with whatever criteria we use to determine if any given assertion is true. So I think that's more or less uh, the opening statement of the book. I got that right. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, now, this kind of conceptual distinction um, can be related to a particular debate in philosophy of biology, which is known as a debate about the definition of species. There are two big crowds on, on, uh, in, in this debate. So there's a clash between those who want to speak of the concept of species and tell us what a species is, and those who want to reduce species to whatever epistemic criteria biologists use to figure out if any two organisms, let's say, uh, belong to the same species or not. And now we may ask, why exactly is the clash? And this particular debate didn't get uh, very far in philosophy of biology. So I just wanted to try to get some uh, lessons out of here. Uh, so there is a clash because, because the two sides emphasize two very different aspects of the problem. So on the one side, the adepts of the concept of species want to tell us what the species really are, are interested in defending an ontological view about the nature of species, which in turn will determine the function this particular concept plays in the uh, overall structure of scientific knowledge. And usually the species are treated as units of uh, generalization, or the basis for units of generalization. So crucially, this definition has nothing to do with any other further considerations about uh, whether one is justified in talking about species in any given particular context. And in fact, conceptualists are very happy to uh, allow uh, one, to allow biologists to adopt whatever criteria of justification are best suited for to the circumstances. Now, as it turns out, things didn't just stay there, things got more complicated, and got complicated because scientists responded to this particular philosophical debate. And science typically responded that making claims about what species really are, or how they function as, the, as units of generalization, is definitely a philosophically fulfilling enterprise. But this kind of answer simply doesn't satisfy the needs of science. And it's not as much as scientists deny let's say, the functional um, uh, role of, of definition of species as a locus of generalization in biology. But other they think that the real problem is figuring out what are the right epistemic criteria for delineating species, because this criteria will not only determine whether generalizing is legitimate or not, but also what exactly is being generalized and which are the objects to which the generalization is applied. So from this perspective, the problem of species is uh, the absence of a consistent set of non-contradictory uh, criteria, a set of, of, of criteria that always gives the same results. Now, the fact that the consensus was not reached within science has simply been taken by uh, many scientists and philosophers to be an indication that there is no unique concept of a species. So that was the, the, the end result. But in fact, there are as many concepts of species as there are criteria for differentiating species. And each of these concepts plays a very different function in science. They cannot all be reduced to the same uh, kind of ontological claim, which in, this, which in turn would support uh, this kind of generalizations. So I think it's, uh, it's getting clear where I want to get with all this. Uh, something similar can be said about the concept of truth. So 
I honestly see no problem in agreeing that a, uh, a unique concept of truth can be defined relative to the function it plays in the context of linguistic practice. And in fact, I'm quite sympathetic to this approach because it strikes me to be an attempt to account for a linguistic phenomenon, the sense in which the way you do philosopher's language, you do, it's more akin to philosophy of science. It's a philosophy of the linguistic science where linguistics is viewed as, uh, as an empirical science. Uh, so it would seem that uh, from this perspective, you know, you started with this elephant problem in the uh, Indian uh, uh, parable. Uh, so from this perspective, the chimeric creature that's described in the parable, it kind of vanishes and gives place to this coherent creature that we immediately recognize as being uh, an elephant. Now, on the other hand, I'm also worried that this kind of answer will tend to satisfy primarily a linguist. And the reason is that it addresses the problem of truth as being strictly a linguistic act. So on the hand, this is the strength of the account because it's an, an, uh, an attempt to figure out what, what truth means in the context of natural language as opposed to trying to defer it to some kind of uh, more or less idealized uh, logical version of, of natural or no logical model of, of uh, natural language. Now, the logician or the philosopher of math might simply dismiss the answer because he or he is not interested in natural language but in logical or mathematical languages, or even worse, in idealized models of natural language. Uh, and what interests me as a philosopher of science is that as a philosopher of science might also retort that scientific discourse is not the same as natural language. There is a sense in which uh, perhaps, for example, a correspondence and this kind of co atomic correspondence isoformism uh, between, uh, you know, the cat is on the mat. The cat corresponds to something, the mat corresponds to something, the relation corresponds to something. Uh, it's hard to capture that in a natural language, but at least some uh, let's say mathematical models uh, in, in science actually try to do exactly that. There is a sense in which truth seems to work that way. Or again, the philosopher of science might simply shift the focus from the concept of truth to the, let's say, more thorny problem of truth conditions. So it might be true that as a linguist, one may not care to differentiate between aesthetic judgments and scientific statements. On the other hand, I think it's the job of both the philosopher of aesthetics and the philosopher of science to make such a distinction. Uh, and what I personally found not problematic but somehow incomplete or unsatisfactory is that to point out that the truth is, the, is an act of commitment to a propositional content, content sorry, is not satisfactory when it's not clear what uh, what exactly is at stake. So the issue of realism versus anti-realism surfaced on um, on several occasions, and I think this is relevant. So in philosophy of science, one can talk about correspondence and isomorphisms, one big uh, way of, of uh, talking about uh, realism and the truth of scientific theories. One can talk about the consistency of uh, an axiomatic systems and all these normalizations problems in, in physics. One can talk about uh, epistemic coherence, or even one he can even adopt things like simplicity and elegance and even a pragmatist notion according to which false beliefs, I mean false in the sense that they correspond to reality, are true because they are adaptive, they promote survival. So when scientists say that, the, for example, the theory of evolution is true, I understand that linguistically speaking they are committed to whatever the theory says. But I cannot help inquiring if this further means that they are committed to the view that this theory corresponds or describes reality or is coherent with other theories or is simply coherent with available data, or understand truth as whatever works as an instrument to, for deriving predictions. I think things can get ugly here in the sense that it's impossible to hold all these commitments at the same time and to clash with each other. And even if different subjects held different commitments, then the theory of evolution will be true or false depending on whatever criterion is chosen. Uh, chosen. And this is where the chimeric elephant tries to creep back in the picture. Uh, so just to wrap it up, 
I fear that uh, this notion that there is a sharp distinction between the meaning of uh, the concept of truth and truth condition, I think it's a philosophical trick, a way of simplifying the problem. And like any tricks, I mean, science is full of tricks, uh, it's, uh, it can be very useful because it allows to formulate a simple version of the problem, one that can be uh, uh, solved, but it can also be misleading. So I think it's useful because it helps pinpoint a relevant context in which it is possible to define a concept of truth that is neutral relative to epistemic criteria, and this would be linguistics. Uh, but it might also be misleading to call this concept of truth a theory of truth when in fact it's only a theory of truth in linguistics. So I think in this sense I want to reiterate the previous comments made by John and Sophia, uh, which I think they did not as much were disagreeing with the notion that truth can be defined uh, relative to its function in, ling in language, uh, but they were rather concerned that the story is incomplete. There is something else to be said about truth over and above its role in, in natural language. That's my comment. Yeah, okay. Um, well, you are and of I, I don't agree with you in some others. Uh, first, uh, uh, well, first, uh, I'm a naturalist. It's true. Uh, second, uh, I, I have uh, paid attention to the, to the relation between truth and the debate between realism and anti-realism, and I have written several papers, and the, right. the problem is quite uh, complex, so I, I mean, I, I'm not going to be able to explain it here now, but something which is relevant is that uh, uh, the, the, I understand the difference between the definition and criteria, but criteria are linked to content, not to truth ascriptions. This is my point. My point is that if you yeah. if you attribute truth to a mathematical content, in order for you to be able to assert this content, you have to pay attention to the realm uh, to which this content belongs. Uh, belongs uh, in the sense that it is mathematical, so. Uh, you need some kind of methodology, and the criteria are such and such, and this is different from the criteria or, me or methodologies or whatever that you have to put to work when you are asserting a content in aesthetics or in empirical sciences or in, I don't know, religion. But when you, are, when you say that any one of these contents is true, the kind of act you are performing is the same. So, I mean, I'm perfectly prepared to, <laughs> to see the distinction between definition and criteria, although that criteria uh, relate to the contents of the speech act, the proposition that you have to put forward, whereas, as I see it, the definition of truth has nothing to do with the epistemic criteria by means of which you are allowed to put forward the content to which truth is attributed. This is, a, I mean, this is my point. And second, I'm interested in linguistics, but not only in linguistics in the following sense. I usually say that uh, it's curious, but uh, philosophers of language are not interested in languages. <laughs> so we don't do uh, uh, linguistics in some in the in the strict uh, sense. Uh, so I'm not interested in English or Romanian or Spanish. So I'm I'm not uh, try. I mean I'm not dealing with uh, linguistic entities. Philosophers of language deal deal with concepts, and of course I'm again I'm prepared to accept that. Uh, uh, Ordinary concepts such as our use of truth in our ordinary exchanges, uh, ordinary concepts can be used in a different way in some other context, for instance, in a scientific context. Of course, no problem with that. So we have technical uses of, of, uh, of uh, ordinary concepts. But in order to, to, to claim that scientific truth 
is true, we should be able to trace some connections between the uses of truth in the in scientific context and our ordinary uses. Otherwise, we should change the, the label and say scientific truth or scientific truth. But it's not truth. <laughs> okay? So it's, it's true that probably there are some differences in the use in which... Uh, I don't think so, I have to say, to be honest. I don't I'm think so at all. I'm not trying to suggest that you should separate the two. But my point was that if you have a concept of truth, the conditions, the truth condition cannot be very far because you cannot just yeah. work with, with half of it. And this is where you introduce this other half, then you create all kinds of disagreements. Yeah, but, okay, I understand. But I don't, I mean, I don't agree in the following sense. Uh, the, the, differ the, differences, the differences between many uses of truth have to do with the content of assertions. Not with the, the the function that truth <laughs> plays in the natural language. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that that I got. <laughs> okay. I agree with that. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> yes, one of the tricks of philosophers' language. Uh, especially the philosopher of language not uh, very much keen of natural language, is to separate conditions, truth conditions, and truth ascriptions, let's say, uh, like, like that. And in your approach, I, I think we have a way to, to, to explain this, and it, so I'll try to do that and see what, what you have to say about that. In, the, in our natural use of the word true, we are very much interested in the criteria. So it, it's very uh, 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 strange for a normal user of the language to say this is true and uh, not be interested in, in how uh, can we uh, check the truth of what you are saying. So we are interested in the in in, the, in this epistemic the epistemic content of this word. But what I'm trying to explain is that, of course, okay, okay, let's uh, we accept this, uh, but we have to explain uh, the use, uh, how we use this, uh, what's the role of this uh, prof sentence is true. And in our use of language, and you are saying that when we look at the use, we can focus on the, uh, the, in the, in the expressivist aspect of your proposition is that the person who says is committed with the proposition, whatever the proposition is. So, but one thing, and now we can explain that. Our interest in the criteria is that to be committed, because you are committed with what you are saying, is not enough to guarantee the truth of the proposition. So, and of course, we, when we are speaking with each other in natural language, we depart from the point that we all assume that you are com we are committed with what we are saying. So this part we we kind of presuppose, and that's why we are usually interested in that criteria only. But of course we presuppose all of that, and you are explaining this presupposition, which is not trivial in a sense. <laughs> Am I saying something yes, perfectly, yes, perfectly. sensical? Yes. And uh, uh, I mean I I agree with Austin in that a theory of truth is a series of truism. So <laughs> unfortunately I'm not saying anything very interesting. But if you think of the way in which, even in, sorry, uh, in which um, in standard uh, formalization of truth theories, truth is uh, introduced, we will say that truth, the notion of truth, is, uh, I have to call it, fictive and factive in the scholarly sense. If you, if you have P, if you have P, from P follows that P is true. And if you have that P is true, from this follows P, because truth is factive. No mystery here. Then, this is completely 
politically correct. What is the problem that, that for instance, that uh, uh, the problem uh, to which uh, uh, Tudor has, point, has uh, pointed to? The problem of criteria in, in scientific uh, debates and so on. Imagine that I say every, uh, I don't know, every even number is uh, the sum of uh, two primes. I don't know. Which are the criteria by means of, of uh, which I, I, I will be able to establish this content? Well, I don't know. Okay, yes, we have to, to do many calculations. Probably nobody knows if it is uh, mm -hmm. true or not, and blah, 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 blah. Again, imagine there is an, a, a, an alternative debate about, so, and in, in some, in somebody says that, I don't know, natural creatures. Evolve by means of natural selection. I don't know. Which are the criteria by means of which I can blah, 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 establish a concept like this one. Criteria are very important, are crucial, but are crucial for a session. Then, once we have the criteria to be able to assert this, then saying that this is true. Doesn't add anything to the content of uh, the content that has, that has been asserted. And again, saying that this theorem, if it is a theorem that I don't know, is true. Saying that it is true, neither needs further calculation, nor adds anything else. And in both cases, the move we have performed is exactly the same in the realm of the uh, uh, biological theory and in the realm of, I don't know, arithmetic. So my point is criteria are crucial, but criteria are relative to content, and contents are the uh, the, the entities that are produced by means of acts of assertion. And once we have this, then applying truth to this content is performing the same kind of movement in any context. This is why I think that truth is the same in mathematics and in religion. Of course, I'm not saying that the criteria <laughs> for assessing religious contents or mathematical contents are equivalent. They are not. But criteria are important for a session. So are they important for truth? Of course, because truth is dependent on assertion. But we can't, but we shouldn't look at the criteria to understand the meaning of truth, because the criteria are highly context dependent. You can't give general criteria, but in a trivial way. So you can't give criteria that apply in the same time to biological contents and religious contents. You can't. You can't give a, criteria, a, set, a set of criteria that apply in the same sense to mathematical contents and empirical contents. So if we don't make this distinction between meaning and criteria, you will say, as many people uh, do, that truth is ambiguous or that there is a kind of truth that applies to mathematics and another, a different kind of truth that applies to empirical science. And I think that this is wrong, but not because I want it to be wrong, but because the way in which we use the term is exactly the same in scientific communities of any kind and in our, in our ordinary exchange. This is my point. I just wanted to um, quote you. Oh, my God. <laughs> when you told uh, Tudor something I will read, okay. something like that, it is true, you said, that scientists are worried with the true or reality of states of affairs. In this sentence, it seems that, it seems to me at first glance, that you were using true in a more realistic sense. No, I mean, I'm, I mean. See, doesn't it? Okay. okay. 
That was now because uh, sometimes uh, when I began to to work w uh, with uh, the notion of truth, I consider myself anti-realist. Till I decided that no, I'm a realist because I'm I'm a mammal, and we mammals are default realists. We cannot help but being realists. I cannot doubt that you are real. So I'm a realist. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that I am a metaphysical realist. So I don't think that there is a, a reality I don't know, I don't understand even the word. A reality out there to which I, I don't know, I, I launch uh, some I don't know, some uh, acts of uh, the referential acts to reach uh, something which is uh, uh, over there, uh, in the other part of a, I don't know, of a uh, epistemic gap. So I think that this is just stupid. So, but now, I'm a realist, and also I'm a correspondent. I'm a Aristotelian. I'm a correspondentist because I think that saying that, uh, I don't know, uh, saying that the sentence today is uh, Friday is true is equivalent to saying that today is Friday. If this makes me a correspondentist, I'm a correspondentist. Again, state of affairs. For me, state of affairs is a, a this discourse about the state of affairs is as empty as the discourse about reality and as the discourse about uh, correspondence. It's our way of pretending we are saying something <laughs> without saying anything. So, of course, I would say, uh, yeah, I, I agree that scientists uh, are interested uh, in discovering state of affairs. I'm not lying when I say this, but I, I know what I mean by this. And I could explain it to you because... I mean, I'm not going to do it. I mean, I'm, I don't, I'm not, uh, I don't like to be boring. But this is just a generalization. I'm not saying anything. If I say that scientists are interested in discovering state of affairs, I'm just saying that for all P, if P, then scientists would be interested in discovering that P. I'm a realist. Yeah, I am. I'm an animal. I am an, an animal, so I have to be realist, but nothing else. Okay, so I'm not contradicting myself. Maybe I am contradicting myself, but I, I don't think so. Uh, may, may I say something? You would say that you are a, a realist in I'm terms a, of the content. I'm not the of, of realist. No, no, in, in terms considering the content of the proposition, because you cannot be a realist in terms of truth as you describe it, because it, it makes no sense. The only sense it makes is that, of course, we are expecting uh, from you when you tell about, when you are saying uh, something, some content, when you are expressing something, we are hoping that you are uh, really committed with. Yes. Okay, but <laughs> yes. so so, yes. uh, but this is not important to the the commitment itself. Well, but you are realist in terms of the content, because the content of the proposition has to do with something which is not only our commitment. This of is and, and because I don't think that, but Frege says exactly the same. I think that, that, that the content of our speech has, is something, of, uh, is something objective, in the sense that I can't objectify. I can't invent their properties. I cannot decide which are the commitments I ascribe. But it's something that, that is, I don't know, socially determined. I don't know in, in which sense. But being a realist, if being a realist means that reality uh, uh, puts some, uh, I don't know, restrictions or restraints, then I'm a, real, a realist. But it's not the way people treat realism in terms of truth. So if you don't make a distinction, Realism of truth is 
Yeah, but, I, but I have decided not to fight to any <laughs> about realism. I'm a realist. Okay. Thank you very much.